In comments to one of my recent videos, one of you asked me to explain how to uh, present qualitative findings. Uh, so in this video I'll talk about this topic and I decided to uh, divide this video into two sections because I wasn't sure what exactly you mean when you asked uh, how to uh, present, how to discuss qualitative findings. So in the first section I will uh, briefly talk about uh, visual representations, how to visually lay out our findings from a qualitative study. And in the second section I will focus on uh, how do we discuss these findings and on the order in which uh, we present the findings. Uh, so this will include how do we, uh, how do we divide our findings, do we uh, discuss them by, uh, for example, a method of data collection or by the themes that we uh, developed or maybe by the groups of participants that we have in our study. So firstly the question of how to visualize the findings, how to present them visually. Uh, so here uh, there is no uh, clear-cut answer because it will really depend on uh, on what you want to present and also on your study, what the aim of the study was and what kind of findings uh, you uh, gathered in your study. In general, I'm a big fan of presenting qualitative findings in a format of a table, a table of themes. Uh, so you have a table in which you list all your themes and uh, list uh, how many times they appeared and also in how many sources, in how many interviews, for example, if you had interviews in your study. This is a very uh, clear way to represent uh, your themes. Uh, it's very practical. Uh, it shows the reader straight away the whole uh, thematic framework and later you can, uh, if you have uh, individual sections that discuss these themes, you can also break that table down into smaller sections of that table. So for example, uh, if you have a, a theme of uh, challenges of online education and, and uh, benefits of online education, as you go into the section on challenges and benefits, you can uh, take sections from that uh, main table of themes that you present at the beginning of your chapter and then just present uh, the small section, the small table that only lists uh, the benefits or only lists the challenges of uh, online education if that was uh, the topic of your study. And two additional considerations uh, with regard uh, to a table of themes are uh, one, uh, should we uh, should we cite, should we provide these numbers that I mentioned, so how many times the theme was discussed and how many uh, how many interviews, that's the first question. Uh, some people uh, do not uh, like the idea of uh, presenting these numbers, arguing that uh, what you do when you, when you present such numbers is uh, quantifying uh, qualitative data. So you're turning qualitative data into numbers uh, so you're making it uh, look like it's quantitative data, in fact. Despite this criticism, uh, there are still many uh, qualitative researchers and authors uh, who still uh, prefer this way, who still argue that it is beneficial to cite these numbers. Uh, and uh, I'm one of these people. I definitely like to give these numbers because without these numbers, you don't really know how strong a given theme was. So if you think about it, if you have a theme or topic that was only discussed by one participant as opposed to a theme that was discussed by let's say 19 out of 20. Uh, of course it's good to show the reader how many times this theme was discussed to, uh, to make our argument, to build our argument for uh, how strong the theme was or maybe uh, for the fact that we decided to uh, include it as one of the main themes in our in our study. So I definitely like to uh, give these numbers. And the second uh, question that I was asked recently is whether you should, uh, in that table of themes, whether you should have uh, a column in which you provide uh, example extracts for each theme. And uh, again, this uh, uh, this depends on individual uh, perspective and approach, but I do not, I do not like to, uh, to give uh, such example extracts in a table uh, for several uh, reasons. The main reason is that it simply makes the table very long and difficult to read. And the second reason is that uh, in order to provide these extracts, you have to, of course, be very selective and you have to decide which extracts to include in that table. And to me, uh, when uh, doing so, there is a risk that you will simply not communicate uh, what this theme was about. So somebody may get a wrong idea about this theme uh, if uh, all they have, at least initially, at the beginning of the chapter, is that table and just 
uh, one or two extracts without any context or any explanation. So I don't like doing that. I prefer to uh, to omit this information, not to give these example extracts in the table. But then as I go through uh, my chapter, as I discuss these themes, I like to explain what they were about and of course use a lot of uh, quotes and extracts from my uh, from my data. And in addition uh, to the table of themes, you can of course uh, include some other visualizations. So you may include some word clouds or uh, or models and diagrams. You can include charts, uh, and this will really depend on on uh, what you like and what you want to include, and also uh, on what kind of study you were conducting. Because uh, sometimes it simply makes sense if you're conducting an exploratory study of some kind of a process, for example. Uh, it's of course good to demonstrate that process uh, through a diagram, a model of uh, certain uh, relationships, how something was likely to influence as one theme was likely to influence the other theme, uh, and so on and so forth. So, so obviously it just makes sense to present uh, this kind of a dynamic uh, model, dyna dynamic relationship. Uh, in addition to your table of themes, because I, I would argue that it's always good to have this table of themes uh, first, the table that I discussed. But also sometimes there are studies where it doesn't seem to make sense to have these uh, these diagrams or models uh, because simply you're not interested in speculating uh, about relationships. Uh, you're uh, To use an example I, I gave you, if you're conducting a study of uh, the participants' opinions about certain challenges and benefits of something, so uh, in our example of online education, uh, you may not necessarily be interested in any kind of relationships. You don't even want to hypothesize about uh, such relationships. So why would you need uh, a model? But then on the other hand, some people like visual representations and they, they can still uh, put all these themes in some kind of a static model that nicely uh, represents uh, the themes that you found in your data. So like I said, it really depends on you. But it is my opinion that it's always whether you choose to uh, supplement this information with some kind of a diagram or chart, it's always good to have a, a clear table of themes from your data. So now uh, let's move on to the uh, more important, in my opinion, part of this video. Uh, so how do you uh, present, how do you discuss uh, the findings of your study? And here again, uh, I won't it won't really uh, help you uh, to know that as many other things, as many other aspects of research, of qualitative research, uh, this will really depend on, on many factors and most importantly on your approach, on what you decide is important. So here I'll go through several uh, approaches, several possible approaches uh, to presenting your findings, discussing your findings, and then at the end I will explain uh, how to select the right approach and and what factors to consider when making that decision. So let's work on our example uh, that I provided before. So let's imagine we have a study, we have conducted a study of, uh, of participants' opinions about benefits and challenges of online education. And in our study, we had two groups of participants. We had teachers and we, have, uh, we had students. So how do we present our findings? Here I suggest that we have uh, a couple of uh, possibilities. So the first possibility, is to present the findings uh, by the main themes. So in our case, let's say the main themes were benefits and challenges of online education because these uh, reflect our research questions. So our, our research questions were, uh, of course, something like what are the perceptions of benefits and challenges of online education uh, by students and by teachers. So when uh, developing our findings chapter or findings and discussion, uh, whatever you prefer, whatever format you prefer, uh, we can uh, organize the chapter into these main themes. So we can uh, start with, uh, for example, the chapter on benefits of online education or section uh, about uh, benefits of online education, uh, followed by a chapter or section on challenges of online education. And, without, uh, and within uh, each of these uh, sections or chapters, we can then divide uh, uh, introduce additional sec sections or subsections. Uh, so these will be our students and teachers. So we have our uh, benefits of online education chapter. Within that chapter, we have uh, the findings uh, from the student uh, interviews or student data. And then we have a section on teacher data. So we first 
uh, go through all the benefits and, and discuss and describe these benefits as uh, as uh, told or, or believed and expressed by our teachers and then we move on to our students. Uh, then we can have another section where we uh, kind of compare these findings a little bit more and maybe highlight some main similarities and differences between the groups. Uh, this will be optional because you can also uh, start with uh, the students and then as you have discussed the student uh, findings and you're going through the teacher findings, you can also uh, always make references back to the previously discussed uh, findings of the other group. Uh, but I do think it's also it's always nice to, to have a section where you uh, combine these and discuss these findings together. So if your first chapter was about benefits of online education and then you went through uh, the benefits as expressed by the teachers and the students, your next chapter will be about uh, challenges of online education and then again within that chapter you'll do the same uh, classification. So you'll start with students and follow it by, by uh, teachers um, or the other way around. But the whole point is that you have uh, clear uh, chapters organized uh, reflecting your main themes and within these chapters you separate uh, the findings into your uh, different group uh, groups of participants. But then you may uh, decide uh, to follow another approach. So maybe you want to divide the chapters by your uh, groups of participants. So in this case you would have a chapter about uh, let's say student uh, data, student findings. In that chapter you'll have sections about uh, students opinions about benefits and students' opinions uh, about challenges of online education. And after that you'll have a chapter on teacher findings and within that chapter you'll have sections on benefits uh, as expressed by the teachers and then benefits as expressed uh, and then uh, challenges as expressed also by the teachers. So unlike in our first approach where we uh, developed our chapters based on our main themes, here we developed uh, our chapters based on our groups of participants and within, uh, within each chapter we discuss the main themes. And then again, ideally it, it would be nice to have another chapter in which you combine student and teacher uh, data and discuss certain similarities and differences. But now uh, to make uh, things a little bit more complex, uh, so hold tight because it will become more and more confusing, uh, imagine that we have also uh, different methods of data collection in our study. So we uh, conducted interviews with these both, uh, both groups, uh, but also we, had, uh, we uh, distributed a questionnaire uh, asking about these benefits and challenges, and also again we distributed that questionnaire among these different groups, so teachers and students. So here uh, a couple of uh, new possibilities uh, arise. So how do we organize this kind of findings? Uh, we can, uh, so the first approach, we can organize the findings by the method uh, because now we have two different methods so we can uh, have a separate chapter on interviews, interview findings and a separate chapter on questionnaire findings. And within each chapter, again, we'll have to make a decision. So this is where the things get uh, quite complex because uh, within the interview chapter, uh, we again have to decide, do we, uh, do we discuss uh, the interviews by the group or by the theme. So, so it will either be the interview chapter and then uh, it will be uh, a section on benefits, for example, uh, and then we'll go through benefits as discussed by, by the teachers and the students. Uh, and then we'll have uh, our next section on challenges and then we'll go through both groups again. Or we can have uh, the interview chapter, the interview findings chapter, uh, and then uh, divided by the groups. So again, so uh, student interviews and then go through both benefits and challenges and then teacher interviews and go through benefits and challenges. And after that, we would have our questionnaire findings chapter. And then again, we have to make the same decision. Do we follow the structure based on, on the main theme or do we follow the structure, uh, the structure based on our, uh, our research participants? But then to make things even more complex, uh, when we have these different methods of data collection, we don't have to divide the chapters by the method of data collection. Uh, we can still divide the chapters uh, either uh, by the theme or uh, by the group of participants. So for example, we can have a student chapter and within it we can either 
divided into student questionnaire findings and student interview findings, or we can divide it into the themes. So, uh, so uh, benefits and challenges, and within each of these sections, we can kind of discuss both uh, data sets. So, for example, uh, we can focus mainly on the interview findings and supplement these findings with our questionnaire data. And then we'll repeat the process for the teacher's data. So we'll have a teacher's chapter and then just uh, repeat what I just said about the student chapter. But we can also still, even if we have more methods of data collection, we can also divide the chapters by the themes. So again, we can have uh, the benefits chapter and the challenges chapter. Uh, chapters separately and then within the benefits chapter we can uh, we can uh, decide whether we want to divide it into student data and teacher data and then uh, and then discuss uh, these uh, different groups or we can divide it into interview findings and questionnaire findings and then within uh, these sections we can discuss for example within the interview findings we can discuss the student interviews and straight away compare that to the teacher interviews. So as you can see, uh, there are so many different possibilities for how to present your findings. Uh, so how do, how do you decide which one uh, is the right one for your study? Of course, as I said in this video, and as I said many times before, uh, there is hardly ever the right way, especially in qualitative research, because all of these are, uh, are correct ways of presenting findings. So uh, you will have to make a decision for what uh, suits your study. Also, uh, you will have to decide which one you're the most, uh, you feel the most confident following which approach. So uh, it will uh, really depend on your preferences, but also on your study and what kind of narration you want to build around your findings. So if it's very important for you, for example, to highlight the differences between the uh, two different groups, it may make uh, more sense to, uh, to focus on uh, developing on dividing your chapters into groups into student and teacher data to make it very clear and focus on uh, uh, on each of these groups uh, separately uh, before having a chapter in which you discuss the findings together but maybe you really want to put uh, your themes in the foreground and you really want to focus on the themes on the benefits and challenges uh, this uh, you believe this is the most important part of your study uh, so you want it to be very clear uh, what kind of uh, themes emerged. Uh, this could also be more suitable if, for example, there was more consistency between the different groups. So you have a very uh, similar, you have two very similar uh, thematic frameworks for each of these groups. Perhaps it would also make a little bit more sense to uh, divide these into themes, because if you have uh, quite different themes, of course, it may be a little bit more messy because you may have more to say uh, on one of these themes and less to say on the other of these themes. So, so this will also uh, contribute to your decision, uh, your personal opinion and your personal judgment. Uh, so you have to think, do I have enough uh, data to put in that chapter to make a separate chapter? And will, will this chapter be uh, comparable to the other chapter? So again, this is, uh, so uh, for example, if you have different methods of data collection and you have plenty of data on interview, uh, from the interviews, but you don't really have that much from the questioners. Uh, perhaps it's not the best idea to have a separate interview and questioner uh, chapters because uh, your interview chapter will be very long and, and very uh, detailed and your questioner chapter will not uh, necessarily uh, be so long. So in that case, it's probably better to, or, uh, to choose a different way. To, so to follow uh, the classification that I mentioned by, by the group, by the group of participants, or maybe by the themes, because you can kind of uh, hide uh, some limitations of your questionnaire this way, because you can focus on discussing the main, uh, the main data from the interviews and just supplement it with, uh, with the questionnaire data. So you, when you talk about the themes, for example, and you say that in the interview, most of the, particip most of the participants said, uh, that the main benefit of online education is that it's convenient. And then you may say that this was reflected in the questionnaire where 90% of the respondent, uh, respondents selected uh, convenience as the main benefit. So you're just using your questionnaire findings to supplement your main findings. And this way uh, you don't really, uh, 
uh, you don't the reader doesn't uh, understand doesn't necessarily know that perhaps your questionnaire findings were a little bit more limited to your main interview findings so as i said uh, this will really depend and uh, the first thing the most important thing that you have to do is to try to plan that chapter first look at your data and try to think what would be the best way to present the findings which one would be uh, the clearest way uh, which one would show your main findings, which one would uh, reflect what you believe is the most important thing about your findings. So again, as I said, is it uh, the difference between the, uh, the, the responses across the different uh, data collection methods, or uh, is it the difference uh, between the two groups and you really want to talk about the two groups and highlight how different they were or how similar uh, they were. Or maybe you want to focus on consistency and how consistent they were and, and you had, as I said, again, these uh, two main themes and you really want them to, uh, to dominate, to be in the center of your uh, presentation of findings. So you'll have to make the decision yourself. Uh, I hope uh, that you enjoyed the video and you learned something new from it. If you did, please like the video to help it get found on YouTube. And if, you, if you're new to this channel, consider subscribing.